Chapter 9 of Hard to Beat by a Self-Made Man This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Bob Goes the Limit on C.H. and D. During the first week of October, Bob and Mrs. Dickens were summoned before the grand jury to give evidence against the man who had committed the assault and robbed her of her satchel on Wall Street. Bob, of course, was a star witness, and his account of the chase and capture of the crook convinced the jurors that the rascal could be convicted when brought to trial, so they returned an indictment against him for highway robbery. When Bob got back to the office that day, he found a letter awaiting him. It was from Mr. Smithers, offering him ten cents a share for the entire holdings of himself and Mrs. Dickens, or, in other words, three thousand dollars cash. Not on your life, soliloquized Bob after he had read it. There was a two-inch item in this morning's Times about Goldfield, and the writers said that the Red Dog Mine was beginning to attract attention again out there. Wouldn't I be silly to sell out now? I guess, yes. I'm going to see my pointer out if it takes all winter, and next year on top of that. Mr. Smithers wouldn't offer ten cents for a pig and a poke. He knows that the information in that letter was a real thing. On the strength of that, I'm going to hold on with a patent copper-fastened grip. When the railroad reaches Goldfield, perhaps we shall see what we shall see. So Bob sat right down then and there and replied to Mr. Smithers, telling him he was not selling Red Dog just at present but when he was, he would be glad to let him know. He won't like this when he gets it, I know, muttered the boy when he addressed the envelope, but then I'm not in the business for the benefit of Mr. Smithers. Two days afterward, he got a reply from the big red-faced man. I'll give you one last chance to close out your stock, and as a further inducement, I will make the price twelve cents, ran the note. Should you refuse this, there will be something doing, my young friend. You don't know what you're up against, because the easiest way is the best, is the reason I raise the ante, but that's the limit. If you know when you're well off, you'll take it. There are some people in this world who don't know enough to go in when it rains. I hope you ain't one of them. A nod is as good as a wink to a blind horse. It was signed William Smithers. There was an implied threat in the letter, but it did not frighten the Wall Street boy worth a cent. More than one broker had remarked that he was a hard boy to beat. At any rate, you could not beat him out of a good thing. And the boy believed he had a good thing in Red Dog. Bob went to the bookkeeper for a stamp to put on the letter he had written to Mr. Smithers when Mr. Scrooge's bell rang. "'I suppose you're going out,' said the bookkeeper as he handed him the stamp. "'You might as well mail these at the corner.' And he handed the boy half a dozen stamped and addressed envelopes. Bob took them, and then went in to see what the senior partner wanted him to do. "'Take this to Mr. Butler, 31 Nassau Street,' and the man passed over a big envelope to his messenger. "'Wait for an answer.' Mr. Butler was a well-known capitalist, and he occupied a splendid suite of offices in the big building. Bob took an express elevator to the tenth floor, where he got off and walked down the corridor, turning to his right till he came to a glass door on which was painted Howard Butler. He opened the door and walked in. It was a large room with a brass railing at the further end, behind which sat three good-looking young ladies working busily at their Remingtons. One of the girls came forward and asked Bob what he wanted, and he said he had a letter from Mr. Butler and expected an answer. "'I will take it to him,' said the girl, and she disappeared into an inner room." The boy walked over to the window and looked out into a big areaway, whence he caught a glimpse of a score or more clerks and typewriters working away in the various offices that also opened onto the air shaft. While thus employed, several persons came to see Mr. Butler and were told to wait until the capitalist was disengaged. Two of these visitors took up their station with an earshot of Bob and began in a low conversation. I've managed to pick up 16,000 shares of a stock in small batches since I got the order to buy all I could of it, said the one man, who was evidently a broker, but Bob did not remember having seen him before, and he knew most of the big fellows by sight. I think Brown and Company have some, said his friend. You might ask them. I will. I want to get all I can before I go on the floor and begin to bid for it. I understand. You ought to get some on the street. C.H. and D. is a staple article, and you ought to pick up a good bit floating around. 
Do you know who are in this combination to boost this stock? No, I don't. And if I did, I wouldn't be saying anything. I'm giving you the tip to buy solely because you are my brother-in-law, and I want you to promise that you'll give Sis a good stake out of your winnings. What are you paying for this stock today? Fifty-two. I guess it'll be higher tomorrow. At any rate, it won't be any lower for some time to come. The moment we begin to buy on the exchange, it will attract notice to the stock and it'll commence to go up. You may expect to see it fluctuate a bit at first, as we shall want to shake off as many of the early buyers as we can and get their stock. I advise you to go to your limit on this, Roger, on a 10% margin. I'll take your advice, Joe, and attend to it at once. At that moment, the young lady who attended to the callers motioned to Bob, and he had to leave the window. However, he had obtained all the information he could have desired. Evidently, C.H. and D. stock was about to be cornered by some powerful clique who had hired this broker, among others, to buy the stock for them. So when Bob got the reply he was to carry back to Mr. Scrooge, his head was full of the C.H. and D. scheme, and before he reached the office, he determined to go into the deal himself on his own little hook. I have $2,600 lying idle in the bank that might just as well be working for me as not, he mused as he walked rapidly on. That broker said the stock was selling at 52. I can buy 500 shares at that figure on a 10% margin. When he went to lunch at 12.30, he drew his money from the bank, carried it to Treadwell and Company, where he had come to be recognized as a very successful small speculator, and put it up on CH&D. When he got back to the office, he showed the receipt to Kitty with a laugh. You see, I'm in it head over heels again. Another tip, laughed the girl. Look out, Bobby. The pitcher that goes to the well may go there once too often and get broken. Well, you just keep your eye on C, H, and D from this out. Every point that goes above 52 means $500 in my pocket. And every point that goes below 52 means... Never mind that, Kitty. I may get a point never to look on the dark side of a pitcher. It makes me nervous to think you have risked so much money on a single stock transaction. It's every cent you had, too, wasn't it? That's right. When I think I have a good thing, I go the whole thing. Otherwise, I leave the thing entirely alone. There's Mr. Scrooge's bell. Run along, little fellow, laughed Kitty. End of chapter 9